Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, we are really, all the team of IRCAD is very proud of this uh, webinar, which has been totally initiated by uh, Naruaki Okamoto here and by Rita Rodriguez, the two young junior who are going to be the interface for the question and answer. And uh, I have to say that when uh, the first time Naoki spoke about uh, these topics, I say, wow, wh why these topics? Uh, I don't think that it's going to have a big success. Uh, and we are today more than 2,000, 2,100, etc. Uh, so I think this topic is interesting. You know that uh, for gastric cancer, it's very clear that we understand that in Asia and in Europe or United States, it's not the same approach. And we... We learn a lot about what Asiatic uh, surgeons they have done for gastric cancer. For colorectal cancer, for me, it's not so clear. Why such a difference between the approach in Asia and in the other country? And so that's the reason, thank you a lot, uh, Nariaki, for uh, this idea to do that, because uh, I have to thank uh, a lot all the experts. We have the best key opinion leaders in colorectal surgery that you can imagine. And uh, I want to say, uh, I don't want to show you any slide, uh, but just to say that uh, we are so happy to have three chairmen today. The three chairmen are Antonello Forgione, he's here, he's uh, part of IRCAD uh, family, Morales Conde, that everybody knows, he's the president of EIS, and he's a major surgeon in colorectal surgery in civil in uh, Spain and Eduardo Targarona, one of the former president of EIS and also an active member of uh, IRCAD uh, family because they are present uh, during all our courses. Uh, I, I see on the screen uh, Professor Bolos, also, also Bill Hill, you know, what we call the Pope when he is in IRCAD, uh, Professor Chen also, Choi Ito, a lot of experts. I have to thank them a lot for what they have accepted to do today. And I would like now just to, 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 to give the floor to Professor Armando Melani and perhaps uh, Wayne Wong, uh, if he is also here. So Armando, for two reasons. The one is because IRCAD is your second house in Strasbourg. Secondly, because you are the director of IRCAD in Brazil, in Barretos, but also in Rio de Janeiro. And third, because you are an exceptional colorectal surgeon in live surgery. I think that what you can demonstrate for all the young generation is fantastic. So I want to thank you. And now I see that the new superintendent of uh, Taiwan Hospital Network, Shoshuan Hospital, uh, Professor Wayne Huang is also ready. So if you can just give a one minute short introduction and after that we give the floor to the chairman. Well, uh, I, I will let Wayne speak first and then uh, I'm going to speak for okay. the last, if you yes. don't mind. No problem. Uh, so uh, it's really exciting for me to join this session, even though I'm, my specialty is not really uh, colorectal surgery, but I see a lot of uh, uh, my mentors uh, here on, on this panel. And of course, um, uh, just a, maybe one word about uh, IRCAD Taiwan. We're so proud to have worked with uh, the IRCAD group for the past 14 years. Uh, next year will be our 15th uh, year. and. Uh, uh, even uh, during the past two years, we have uh, really done a, a great deal uh, to combat the situation of the pandemic. Uh, we were able to, uh, you know, Taiwan is one of the strictest countries for uh, for quarantine and border control. Um, but uh, so there's basically no uh, foreigners that is really allowed to join our workshops. Uh, but we're able to uh, change a lot of formats to uh, train a lot of Taiwanese surgeons uh, for the hands-on and also uh, for, for the for the um, for the online workshops uh, to do a similar fashion uh, as in Eric and friends and hopefully we're certainly looking uh, to open our borders in the third or fourth quarter of this year and we are really excited to welcome all of you to back to your Taiwan and to uh, uh, to rekindle our friendships again and also to uh, continue uh, surgical education in Yerka Taiwan and so I uh, really wish the today everybody a good success and and the floor uh, back to you um, Armando. So thank you very much thank you very much Jack uh, 
Thank you very much, Okamoto, for this opportunity, and Rita. Uh, I see my friend Antonello. Uh, I believe that this is a very important point from NIRCAD. Once uh, we got uh, all our training centers, uh, usually they have uh, on-site training. With the pandemic, we're forced to do some webinars. And those webinars bring us uh, an idea about points that we should discuss a little bit more deeply or superficially, depends on the situation. But the most important thing is that this webinar represents a snapshot what we have in one of our courses. So uh, we have in Brazil, uh, IRCAD uh, since 2011, one Colorado course is one, is one of the strongest one in all of the centers. Uh, what I'm gonna say now is that if you want to know a little bit more of that, you should come to Strasbourg or Taiwan or Latin America, depending where you are located. Once we have more than 2000 people watching us nowadays, because this kind of discussions is exactly the type of crossfire that we do in the last day. So hot topics, we put experts to fight each other, to bring their ideas, to understand what's going on, because sometimes it's not clear. And, and when we have the opportunity to, to travel all, all over the world and we see those differences, and we sometimes we don't understand why people are not following some schools or are not doing another thing that we should do. But the most important thing is that this experience to put together different schools are gonna give you an idea about Colorado surgery in the world. And this is very important. Professor Hilde is here. And he is uh, uh, the Pope that we say in Colorado surgery. And he is the guy that sometimes is still open his mind about new features and new technologies and new proposals for Colorado surgery. So uh, I'm gonna just say that uh, this webinar are gonna be amazing, but this is not, it's just a snapshot from what we have in our courses. I invite you to come to one of our Colorado courses at IRCAD. So thank you very much, uh, Armando. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be here together with this uh, fantastic team of experts from all around the world. A major thank you, of course, to Professor Marisco that thanks to IRCAD uh, makes all this possible. And uh, as uh, Armando mentioned, this is exactly the spirit of the IRCAD courses all over the world to exchange uh, our practice, uh, to exchange our uh, approaches, because we believe that uh, from these exchanges, we can only improve what we do daily in the operatory room. Anyhow, uh, I think that this is also time that we do not have to base uh, our assumption on our practice, but uh, this is the time of evidence-based medicine, so we need uh, to evaluate scientifically uh, the clinical results that uh, we can collect uh, uh, during our uh, daily job. And for this reason, we uh, strongly believe that this uh, effort to, to discuss in an open way, it's really worth uh, uh, the case. My role uh, as a chairman is not to, to take the time, but just to uh, recall everybody that we must stick uh, to the time that has been uh, allotted to every expert because we really want uh, the session to be interactive. We really expect uh, our colleagues from all around the world to take benefit of this uh, panel of experts to ask a question. And I recall uh, that uh, the next effort that our two brilliant fellows will do uh, is to put together all the reply and uh, produce a document that can be uh, as much as possible effective in your daily practice. So we want to move from idea to a more a structured evidence of what we do into the operating room. This is the time of evidence-based medicine and not anymore of evidence-based medicine. So I will leave uh, uh, the floor and then uh, of course our two uh, great chairman, Professor Salvador Morales Conde and uh, Professor Targarona, they will have the time and uh, long the discussion to, to make their point and their, uh, and their suggestion. But to, to be on time, I would like to ask uh, uh, Nariaki Okamoto to present uh, in time uh, where uh, this idea came from, and then we move to the expert uh, panel. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, we can hold this webinar. Uh, I would like to be grateful to ILCAD and ILCAD Taiwan and uh, ILCAD America Latina for the great support of the webinar and the Spanish Association of Surgeons and uh, Japan Society for Endoscopic Surgery for their help in promotion it. And uh, I appreciate the faculty, staff and all participants. Thank you very much. Uh, first, please let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, I am a Japanese colorectal surgeon and I have been at ILCAD France as a surgical research fellow uh, since 2019. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Strasbourg. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to explain the background and why I propose the webinar project. Uh, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the world. In the past, uh, the number of colorectal cancer patients was higher in the West and lower in the East. However, over the past 30 years, the number of colorectal cancer patients in Asian countries has been gradually increasing. According to the global cancer statistics in 2018, the incidence of age standardized colorectal and rectal cancers are late in Asian countries such as South Korea, Taiwan, China, and Japan are few different than in Europe. Uh, we have many courses on various uh, gastrointestinal surgery at Ilcal France. I feel that bariatric surgery is still more common in the West than in the East, and the gastric cancer surgery is still more common in Asian countries such as Japan and South Korea than in Europe. Uh, there are still regional differences in the number of cases and in the number of surgeons who specialize. On the other hand, in terms of colorectal cancer surgery, there is no longer a regional difference. However, there are still differences in treatment strategy for colorectal cancer between the West and the East. ILCAD webinar started in June 2020. Uh, so far, there have been about 48,000 viewers. In July 2020, we held a webinar on light hemicolectomy. We had over 1,000 registrants uh, and uh, we conducted an international survey about laparoscopic light hemicolectomy. Uh, we received 440 respondents from 78 countries. Uh, the results were very interesting. Uh, here are a few examples of regional difference. Surgeons in the Asian region prefer external anastomosis, while European and American surgeons tend to choose internal anastomosis. Also, post-operative oral intake starts earlier in Western countries than in the Eastern countries. We have published this result in January 2021. ILCAD contact collector surgery course every June and November. Of all the ILCAD courses, this is one of the most well attended. After all, even there are some discussion about the differences in surgical treatment strategy between Asia and Europe. But perhaps because of the small number of participants from Asian countries, there are several times when it seemed as if there was not enough discussion. I, want, I wanted to have an opportunity for a sufficient discussion. For this webinar, we have selected four of the most interesting topics in colorectal cancer treatment, complete mesocolic excision or DC lymphonodectomy, lateral lymphonode dissection, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, and local resection for colorectal tumors because they are different between guidelines in each country on these topics. Before this webinar, we conducted the brief survey on these topics. Tentative results of this survey will be presented before each topic's presentation. We are still open to the survey link. We'll post the link in the comment section. We would be happy, very happy if you could answer this survey. Thank you very much. And I hope that this webinar will help you make more treatment options and benefit for your patient.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nariaki. Very nice introduction. Uh, real the spirit of IRCAD that comes up also in this uh, initiative. And now we I will see from Rita the results of this uh, preliminary survey, at least in uh, general terms. And then uh, before each presentation, we will analyze uh, the data uh, that come out of the survey. So please, Rita. Is it done? You see the, the live uh, demonstration? Ça va? Passe-moi un clic-chair. Non, il n'est pas branché dessus. I would, tout à on a if it is possible, Melody, can we have a word from uh, Professor on. Targaruna in the meantime? I'd like to ask uh, Eduardo, uh, just uh, in the meantime, that we set the technical issue. Eduardo, buenos dias. Wait a second. We, we wait for your voice here, Eduardo. Just one second. You're muted, Eduardo. You, you need to unmute. Sorry. Yes. Thank you very much to have the opportunity to share this uh, this two hour with you. And I would like also, first of all, first of all, to congratulate Professor Marisco for two, two, three, three aspects. One is to to listen to the young people, to the young surgeons, and to 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 listen to Rita and all and and Riyaki for this wonderful initiative. Second one is how to adapt the things that you have learned from the COVID, like, like it's the webinars. Really, it's a new way to have a wonderful, as he commented, more than 2,000 people, uh, 2,000 people um, simultaneously listening to this webinar, and also to choose so, uh, so good uh, and, uh, and friends and colleagues to introduce this topic. Nothing more to say, uh, really uh, very, very, uh, very happy to be, to, be, to, to be today with us. And please, Antonello, please go, go on with the webinar. Very much, uh, Eduardo. It's uh, always a pleasure to to have you in the team. And uh, so now uh, our fantastic uh, audiovisual technician that really deserve a big uh, applause uh, for what they can achieve every day in IRCAD. They fix the problem. And so Rita is going to comment about the results of the of the survey, the number of participants, and then we move to the hot topics and uh, we start this uh, very interesting discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for for the opportunity to participate in this interesting webinar. And as we can see, uh, we conducted the international survey. And although we have 2,052 participants, we only have 250 respondents from uh, from uh, 780 countries. So this is a uh, a uh, clear example that we really appreciate if you can uh, get into the survey and uh, and share all your your experience in your surgical practice and i will be presenting the results uh, in in each topic that we that we decide um, that we decide to do. So the first will be, uh, do you routinely perform complete mesocolic excision or DT lymphadenectomy for advanced colorectal cancer? And as we can see here in Europe, uh, almost 47% uh, of the participants do not perform either CME or D3, while in Western Pacific countries, we have only 18% of participants that do not perform. So we can see here clearly a difference in, the, in, in surgical practice. So we can move forward to the, to the presentation of our, of our experts. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, this is uh, the real proof even if uh, the numbers uh, that are at the base of this data are not huge, but uh, this is the feeling that we all have uh, of this huge difference between uh, East and West regarding uh, CME and the drill into lymphadenectomy. So the first speaker will be Professor Chen uh, from Taiwan, and he's one of very uh, important key opinion leaders in this, uh, in this field. 
And then we will have um, the presentation from uh, Professor Boyo. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly in Spanish. Uh, that will give the, the Western side of the story. And after that, we open up the discussion. And again, we hope that uh, our colleagues will be really interested to, to ask their question. Could be technical, could be more on the oncological side, but really, please take advantage of this occasion to, to ask your, your most urgent question. So, Professor Chen, good morning. Uh, actually, good afternoon. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kuss, uh for your kindly invitation. The concept of TME was proposed by Hill, and TME has been adopted as the standard surgery for rectal cancer because of its decreased local recurrence rate and better outcomes. The concept of CME was proposed by Hohenberg in 2009 and its excellent outcome were reported. Since then, many institutes adopt CME and CVL as the standard surgical procedure for colon cancer. This systemic review and meta-analysis study of total cohort 26,000 patients with nearly equal patient distribution, showing a better overall three years and five years survival and five years disease-free survival in the CME group. And there were no statistic difference in terms of overall complication. So as we know that CME uh, is a better surgery as compared to conventional surgery. And what's the difference between the Western CME and D3 dissection mainly is because of the lymph node dissection uh, and the length of bowel resected. The CME procedure requires proximal vascular ligation, but does not require specific dissection at the origin of the feeding arteries. On the other hand, the Japanese D3 dissection removes all lymph nodes stations depending on the tumor's location and the depth of tumor involved. However, central lymphonectomy is more extensive in the original CME than the Japanese D3 dissection. For example, a dissection of an extra mesenteric lymph node is performed during CME procedure for a tumor located at the hepatic flexure of the colon. This is not a routine out here in the East because the pathologically proven metastasis in this area has been very rare. Also, we do not perform the Cochrane maneuver for, of, of mobilizing the duodenum and the pancreatic head to expose the origin of the SMA for tumors that do not invade the other organs. First, I will talk about lymph node dissection, the yeast principle. In the yeast, we usually follow the Japanese guideline for lymph node dissection, which is expressed with the D number. As for D1, is we call it the pericolic lymph nodes. D2 is intermediate lymph nodes around the feeding artery. And D3 is main nodes uh, located just nearby the superior mesenteric artery or vein. And this is applied for both uh, sides of the colon cancer, left and right. And usually we do not perform any lymph node dissection for TIS tumor, and which we call it a D1 or D0 operation. And as for D2 dissection, it's applied for tumor, for T1 tumors, because the incidence of lymph node metastasis is about 10% and 2% at the intermediate node. Therefore, a D2 dissection is proper. And for T2 and above uh, tumors, we like to perform a D3 dissection because there's a 1% main nodes involvement for T2 tumor. Now, I'm gonna use 
this video as an example of how we dissect the lymph nodes in right colectomy. In right colectomy, there is no anatomic structure that serves as a boundary between the intermediate and main lymph nodes stations. With regard to the distinctions between D2 and D3 dissection, we should note that the colic veins are ligate at its origin from the superior mesentery vein in both D2 and D3 procedures. However, in a D3 dissection, the fatty tissues along the axis of SMV is dissected in order to completely remove the main nodes. Generally speaking, this dissection should be done before the ligation of the artery. Next, I'll talk about the length of bowel resection between the, the difference between the east and west. As according to the Japanese classification, if the feeding artery here is close to the proximate to the tumor, you need to have a 10 centimeter. If it's away from the tumor, and then you have to uh, have additional five centimeter. If it's just right between two feeding artery, you need to have both sides to have a five centimeters in, in length. And in contrary, if the feeding artery is away from the proximal, you need a five centimeter here to resect uh, the bowel. And this is the principle out here in the east. So let me use a quick example uh, of how the east is different from the west. When performing a surgery uh, here for cecal cancer in the east, all we need is uh, from the feeding artery here, the edicolic artery, and you just have to take set two cent 10 centimeter on both sides, and that will be it, and you can do an anastomosis right over here. And for CME, you need to take the right branch of the uh, mesocolic artery, and you remove all the mesocolon here. And so this is the principal difference from the extent of resection of the bowel here uh, east is different from the west. With that, I would like to conclude my talk, Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Although both surgical procedures are similar, a distinct difference exists. Both techniques are associated with good surgical outcomes. Removal of the main nodes is employed. I think future studies are needed for standardization of right collectible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. Very didactic and clear anatomical landmarks and technical details. I really appreciate that you were perfectly on time and I Again, I recall everybody to, to do the same. Uh, it's very much appreciated here. And uh, as uh, per our program, we keep the discussion after the second presentation. So please, uh, Professor Boyo, go ahead with your speech and stay on time. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation to speak about the state of complete mesocolonization in Europe as a brief introduction, we want to comment that the most performance surgical procedure in, in colorectal cancer in Europe is right colectomy, rather than sigmoidectomy, according to the DAC audit of the Spanish registry, as you can see in the slide. We are agreed that the best approach for the right colectomy is laparoscopic with a high level of evidence. In the same way, at the moment, there are several randomized trials and meta-analyses that demonstrate some clinical advantages in favor of intracorporeal gastroposis. But uh, what is the real situation in the right colectomy? According to, the, to these two surveys, uh, there are significant differences between European surgeons when we perform a right colectomy. 
The power preparation is used in 60%. The laparoscopy approach is used in more than half of the cases. We mostly perform mechanical side-to-side extracorporeal -side anastomosis, and European surgeons suffer around 8% anastomotic leak rates. Also, the use of ERAS protocol is greater in Europe than in the East. But know that these two papers don't comment anything about the complete anesthesia of the three concepts. We are agreeing that the, in the right oncological colectomy, we must tie the iliocolic vessels, the right colic vessels, and the right branch of the middle colic vessels. And according to the Japanese classification, in the other part of the slide, we can perform a D1 with leaf node resection in red, a D2 in blue, and D3 in yellow. 14 years ago, Hohenberger described the improvement in survival in colon cancer if we perform a complete nasocolon extension compared to the conventional resection. Bertelsen subsequently published his series of uh, 1,000 patients in the Lancet Oncology with the same conclusion. But uh, he also comment that the complete nasocolon extension is an independent factor, is an independent predictor that improves overall survival. In other words, we must perform a complete a complete dissection of the mesocolon through embryological planes with a central ligation in order to increase the survival in right collectomy. But we return to the real world, world and from Spain, one month ago, I carried out a survive for a social media network and we presented a young patient with T3 and one red colon cancer. According to the previously scientific evidence, we should perform at least a complete mesocolon extension. And I really think the best technique for this patient will be a D3 dissection. But most surgeons answer that they would perform a standard dissection. In the same way, two years ago at the European Congress of Coloproctology, a surgeon from the Netherlands commented that when we wanted to perform a complete mesocolon extension, we actually performed a D1.5 dissection, not D2, neither. Why is so difficult the implementation uh, of the uh, complete mesocolon extension of D3? And why do I see so many differences between Eastern and Western surgeon? In my opinion, there are five reasons. The first, re uh, first reason is that complete mesocolon extension is a new concept. If we carry out the bibliographical search for the complete mesocolon extension of D3, the number of publications has been increasing in the last five years. But know that the Japanese clinical Guidelines already describe extending lymphadenectomy 40 years ago, like Chinese or Korean clinical guidelines. The second reason is that the definition of the literature is very valuable in relation to D2, D3 of uh, um, complete mesocolon extension, and many authors mix the D2 dissection and the complete mesocolon extension. In addition, uh, there is a lack of standardization and definition of the surgical technique. The following article tried to describe how we should carry out different procedures. This is the Hohenberger Mary article. He made a brief definition of the step to perform a complete mesocolon extension, highlight the decision to embryological plane and central vessel ligation. And more recently, uh, Spasonevich described in this article the precise limits and the, uh, of a D3 dissection. But in this article, this uh, other article, Bertelsen described the technique uh, he used for a complete mesocolon extension. And this is another new article that tried to describe the step for a complete mesocolon extension with D3 and central ligation with imaging and photographs. The third reason is the existence of different clinical guidelines around the world. In this article, they compare the difference between the Eastern and the Western clinical guidelines. And European guidelines recommend a block resection of lead nodes with the arterial alcada filling with a minimum of 12 nodes. And they suggest removing only suspicious leaf nodes that are not contained in the arcada. On the other hand, the Japanese society suggests that the D3 lymphadenectomy in selected D2 and in all D3 and in all D4 cancer, as well as in all nodes positive patients. The fourth reason for this low implementation, I think uh, the mesocolon extension is a difficult due to the right column vas vascular variability. As you can see in this graph, Jamali already classifies 
the laparoscopic right colectomy with intracorporeal is as one of the most difficult procedures. But note that the vascular dissection, the right colon, is the second most difficult uh, laparoscopic procedure. According to the following meta analysis we can observe the different anatomical variation that exists, that exists in the artery of the right column. Uh, but we must add the relationship uh, with the superior mesenteric pain above situation or behind situation. But in addition, we must highlight that there are different classification of branches of the head tract and different subtypes, depending on the outcome of the cadaver study or rather studies. And I think uh, that all this vascular variability could increase the lesion of the superior mesenteric pain it branches as first or as relax ratomyces studies described, leading to this catastrophic complication. But in addition to vascular injury, we can also make a lesion to the superior mesenteric nerve plexus situated around the vessel, as you can see in the pathological exam as the bottom of the slide. The nerve lesion could lead a diarrhea or chronic pain or the positional disorder. To avoid this complication, we must study the vascularization of the right colon using the patient CT scan. We can use also uh, use three-dimensional printed, printed uh, reconstruction of virtual reality reconstruction. In addition, we can help with the robotic platform to carry out more carefully this action. And the last reason for this low implementation of the color Colon mesocolonestesium, complete mesocolonestesium, is the lack of scientific evidence. They have, uh, these are the last uh, meta analyzed with more than 2,000 patients. And the authors state that there are no differences in relation global mortality, but there are differences in leaf non harvested quality of oncological resection or overall survival. But we must take care because one author described that the great analysis uh, results in a very low grade evidence in oncological outcomes. And with the data available today, it's not possible to demonstrate that complete mesocolonization has oncological superiority in terms of survival when compared with the traditional right colon. In this way, due to the lack of scientific evidence, different randomized trials are being published on the benefits of complete mesocolonization or D3 compared to the standard surgery. This Japanese trial uh, confirms that the laparoscopic approach to the free section is safe and radical compared with the open surgery, but the procedure should perform by experienced surgeons. These trials from an Italian group or Russian, Russian group describe that completeness of colonization and D3 uh, need more operation time but don't increase the mor morbidity. In the same way, the Chinese trial with more than 1,000 patients confirmed that postoperative complications do not increase. However, the lesion of the super mesenteric pain and halen trunk do increase, so they recommended a systematic training. These uh, three randomized studies invite us to wait for a long term oncological result to consider complete mesocolon extension as the gold standard in the right connection. And finally, I would like to comment that uh, complete mesocolonization of D3 is a difficult procedure with a long learning curve. So we must do training programs and understanding of the vascular anatomy is essential with a CT scan or three dimensional reconstruction. And while we wait for the long term oncological results of the trial, we must audit the pathological. A specimen of the complete mesocolonization in the right colectomy as the, tot as le the total mesorectal decision in rectal cancer. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Boyo. Uh, very didactic uh, presentation once again, and I really appreciate the balance between uh, your different points and uh, the prudence that you are uh, uh, asking for in the meantime that we receive the uh, results of uh, more scientific uh, paper. Um, I mean, my little comment, uh, my two cents, as uh, we used to say, is that um, all those things, uh, they, begin, they begin like an intuition and then they become more and more evident uh, the more we uh, use to apply and to perfect what we do. So I think that the right approach is exactly as you, as you say it. Um, 
we see if we do we have any question from the audience uh, nariaki uh, and rita yes. uh one question from the audience uh excuse me professor ito and professor fukunaga the yeah they connected yes yes yes. Ah, yes yes excuse me so the one uh participant uh want to ask the japanese uh professors uh the the there is the international uh, t-lex trial about the the length of the boil resection the lead from japan so do you have uh, any update of, of the findings of the these trials so from me actually i don't know the very detailed data of the t-rex but uh, uh recently I, I my opinion is your european style uh, resection uh, is too much resection of the boil length so the, i think that uh, if we uh, resect iliocolic uh, resection maybe don't need to resect uh, resect for the transverse colon or too much ascending colon. Just a uh, waiting 10 centimeter rule is uh, one of the very uh, general, uh, good, good rule because uh, we have a very rarely uh, local uh, recurrence uh, after uh, right side, uh, sided colectomy of Japanese way. So I think the uh, most important thing is the uh, unblocked resection. So very uh, shortage of the resect, uh, length of the resection range uh, D2 or D0 for T3 cancer is uh, maybe the bad result. So this is my opinion. So I really sorry to don't know the uh, detailed information from the T-Reg trial. Okay. Thank you, Nariaki. Any other question, Rita? Yes, we have a question also from our same participant that it's connected from England, and it's uh, that if we are complicating too much about the D3 right hemicolectomy, describing the myriad of variations according to the Hanlon trunk, uh, which is of their less technical importance over the main iliocolic artery and middle colic vessels. What is your opinion about this? Is it too, is it too complex to, to be reproducible? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the major issue always on the table that we are making uh, a procedure that is, uh, let's say, quite straight, uh, and more complicated, more at risk uh, for the patient. Uh, I would like to ask uh, this question to Professor Boyo, who uh, actually was uh, uh, more in favor, I think, of a selective approach that uh, probably at this stage uh, is the most prudent one. Professor Boyo, did you get the question? Would you yes. like to reply, please? Yes, I think in, in right colon cancer, the D3 or CME is, is, is indicated in some cases, but I think like uh, the RELAC uh, randomized control trial and other papers is a very difficult uh, technique. And this, this technique could increase the lesion of the, of the uh, mesenteric, superior mesenteric vein, uh, can, we can lesion the duodenum, we can lesion the pancreas. It's a very difficult uh, procedure and we have to select very well the, the patient that we have to, to make this procedure. Yeah, uh, I think that I will take advantage of uh, the presence of Salva uh, because I know that uh, he's one of those uh, uh, very passionate but at the same time uh, scientific uh, uh, surgeon in the world and that is assessing the usefulness of uh, new imaging modalities. I think that uh, slightly and slowly we are moving uh, from, uh, let's say, a more anatomical based uh, oncological surgery to a more targeted based uh, oncological surgery. And this is uh, the next step, uh, in my opinion, in the field of uh, oncology surgery. And I know that Salva is experimenting a lot to the use of fluorescence. I noticed that uh, neither of you uh, mentioned this uh, uh, really, let's say, in a, in a very specific way. So I would like, Salva, would you comment in just uh, two minutes so that we keep uh, the timeline uh, about uh, what's coming on uh, with the new imaging modalities, please? Okay, thank you very much, Antonella. Thank you, uh, the ILCA, for the invitation. Just to be short, uh, I do really believe in ICG. I think ICG is a nice tool uh, to determine what you're going to do, or at least to see how far you want to go. I have nice videos in which you can see 
when you inject ICG intraoperative, how is the, uh, what is the, the, the lymphatic pattern of each individual, uh, um, each individual patient? And that is what really help uh, to determine how far you have to go with the lymphadenectomy. Of course, we need not a nice study, but not that. Also, but we also need to determine exactly how to inject the ICG and when. I think, it, I think this is the answer that we need to have and we need to, 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 to come together with effort together in a multi-center study to determine that. But I think ICG can give us important information about the different pattern of, of, of the lymphatic pattern of the different tumors in different locations. And I think it's very important and we have nice images and we, we, we can see that. So thank you, Antonello. Thank you, Salva, for your comment. And uh, I mean, it's not uh, my role, as you see, is to keep uh, is to keep the timing. Uh, so I will not uh, go further in the discussion. As uh, Armando Melani mentioned, this is uh, the IRCAD story. It's uh, evolving, and uh, during uh, the next uh, events, of course, we will go deeper and deeper in these uh, topics. So I would leave, uh, let's say, the topic open uh, for further uh, thoughts. And we move to the next uh, uh, very hot, hot uh, uh, discussion. And I see two giants. I see the Pope uh, that is ready uh, to shoot his gun. And uh, I see Professor Choi that uh, undoubtedly is uh, one of the best and most refined surgeon I've ever seen in my life, to be honest. And uh, they are going to discuss, uh, not fight, but discuss about the different approaches uh, between um, West and East in terms of uh, lateral nodes dissection. Professor Choi, uh, thank you for being always a very, very valuable and reliable experts of the IRCAD courses. And uh, we have, uh, before I forget, sorry, I apologize, Rita. Uh, we, before uh, your presentation, we just want to share the results of the survey that uh, the two fantastic fellows have uh, conducted. I apologize, Lisa. No, it's okay, Antonello. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will only take uh, 30 seconds. We have, do you recently perform lateral lymph node dissections in advanced rectal cancer? So surprisingly, in Europe, we had 18% of people who is, uh, who is performing uh, the lateral lymph node compared to 10% in the Western Pacific countries. But we want to, to stress that the majority of the respondents were uh, from China. And as Nari uh, point out, it's not routinely performed. So perhaps when we have more details about the survey, we can have a clear view about the difference in this topic. Thank you very much. So, I mean, my, my little comment over here, Professor Hilde, that uh, despite it's not common, but uh, is present in Europe, this uh, lateral nodes dissection. And uh, we're gonna see, and I'm really uh, looking forward to listen to your presentation. Even though I feel very humble to ask these, uh, to those two giants, please uh, stay on the time that we have allocated in order to have uh, some discussion at the end. So thank you very much. Professor Choi. Thank you so much, uh, Jack and Mariake and uh, Antonello for kind invitation. And also it is a great honor to have a debate on what the public know this section with uh, Dr. Bill Hill, whom I always respect most. Okay, let's get start, uh, started from my side first. The lateral pelvic nodes, lateral pelvic uh, lymphatic spread has been well described by doctors in both sides of the world since all, almost a hundred years ago, but the treatment currently for the patient or suspicious rotor pelvic nodes actually differs. The instance of a metastatic uh, instance of the metastatic rotor pelvic node varies depending on the tumor location and depth. According to the recent LCT uh, from Japan, without radiation, when considering only patient with rotor pelvic node less than one centimeter in diameter on preoperative uh, MRI and stage one to three low rectal cancer may have uh, only 7.3% of lateral pelvic node positivity. But the, the larger lymph nodes, the higher metastasis rates up to 21% when we include five millimeter uh, to the one centimeters. 
When we include the case larger than one centimeter, the incidence even goes higher. If these suspicious rotor pelvinodes were not dissected, um, yeah, the, you know, the higher local recurrence rate than uh, lateral, lateral pelvic node dissection plus TME. So, but the, uh, however, this uh, Japanese style of uh, prophylactic lateral pelvic node dissection without radiation might not be accepted outside of Japan because the positivity is only 7% which means more than 90% of patients cannot avoid unnecessary rotor pelvic node dissection. And also overall survival was quite similar in both groups. Only local recurrence was higher when not surgically uh, removed. So it is not accepted yet. So let's think about the Western style uh, of rotor pelvic node dissection uh, uh, you know, the Western style so always believes in radiation. Of course, thanks to CCLT, neoadjuvant radiation, sometimes we can apply watch and wait policy for selective patient uh, with their uh, clinical CR. However, uh, well, we all know the neoadjuvant CCLT is an effective tool for advanced rectal cancer, however, even when we have a good response in med rectal lymph node, still we do TME rather than local excision. This means we rely on radiation, but not perfectly believe the efficacy of the radiation for uh, lymph node uh, the, the eradication. So probably uh, this collaborative uh, study is most highly cited to support the value of lateral pelvic node dissection even after neoadjuvant CCLT for T3, T4 low rectal cancer. They collected data from centers in Asia as well as in the West. The most, the oncologic parameters, including lateral local recurrences, cancer specific survival showed better results in lateral pelvic node dissection group than the TME only group, even after neoadjuvant chemo radiation, especially when lymph nodes are bigger than, larger than seven millimeters in short axis. So the lateral local recurrence was uh, profoundly and significantly higher in TME alone group. The, our study also showed a similar result when we compared the rotor pelvic node dissection group even after good response to CCLT, which is group B, with the TME alone group, with the, uh, which is the group A. And when we had a look at into the group A, in which we did only TME after good response to CCLT for patients showing five millimeter or larger suspicious rotor pelvic nodes, on the initial pelvic MRI. Overall recurrence rate was very high and mostly local recurrences. Among these local recurrences, lateral recurrences was the most common uh, the, uh, findings. A half of our local recurrences were only lateral pelvic nodes recurrences, which might be avoided by if we remove surgically these lymph nodes. So, as you can see here, regardless of the response to CCLT, when we, when suspicious rotor pelvic nodes was larger than five millimeter in initial MRI, rotor pelvic node dissection group showed significantly better results uh, in uh, my series. So the most important thing, the selection of the patient is key. So many studies stu uh, suggested that five millimeter uh, up to seven millimeter can be a good cutoff value to indicate rotor pelvic node dissection. However, this is very hard to say that this is their absolute size. This is the problem. So someone may say that the metastasis to rotor pelvic side wall is a systemic disease. However, it doesn't matter if it is a regional. If you believe this is regional, you can remove them as you do CME or TME, whatever. Even you think that this 
the systemic, you have to remove them as you do in liver resection or lung metastasis. So it doesn't matter. So that, then what is the real reason not to do rotor pregnant or dissection? Maybe by any chance, is it because of a fear for doing difficult procedures, which is uh, you may not be familiar with? We have to think about this. So in conclusion, rotor pelvic node dissection should not be exaggerated for potentially unnecessary patients, nor should the effectiveness of rotor pelvic node dissection or neoadjuvant chemo radiation be ignored for patients with rotor pelvic node involvement. Thank you very much. Dr. Choi, and uh, I would uh, leave immediately the, the floor to uh, Professor Hilt and uh, to listen to his, uh, to his speech. Professor Hilt, good afternoon. I am trying to unmute. Here you are. We listen to you. You hear me? Yes, oh, you have perfectly. control of it all then. That's okay. Um, but I, my pointer would not get on the unmute for some reason. I think it's because the lovely lady there has taken control. So if I may have my presentation, please. Um, I can, there Here we are. are. Yes, I need to make it function. How do I get it to full screen? That is my problem. Uh, if I go to my, uh, I have given it to you, but I wanted to use my own, yes. if I may. Yes, you can. But now you, you share first. I need to get to a part of my, um, I need to get to part of there. It is against lateral nodes here. Do you have that now? Not yet. You need to share. Well, I have it on. I have it full screen. Yes, you need to share first with us on the Zoom interface. Sorry, you I have to, to do. You need, you need to share on the Zoom interface first. To the green well, arrow at the bottom of the Zoom interface. Or we can, or we can play it, but. No, I think it is best that I, I don't understand. We, we practiced. You want me to share? Yes, yes. And now you can put that on full screen. Great. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so now I have a quick eight minutes. Uh, in the 1980s, I'm the oldest person here, and I have lived through uh, a lot of different opinions on all of this. Uh, essentially, Back in the 1980s, the Japanese already had a big lateral node surgery activity. Uh, on the west coast of the United States, various people tried it. Warren Enker became a close friend, and he told me that uh, when TME and then MRI came, he gave it up. I was wrong about the lateral nodes, he said. Uh, I have to say we were both trying to argue against the pelvic rape that most people were doing. And during those last 20 years of the last century, things got better. Why did they get better? Was it because we thought about lateral nodes or was it because I tell the story from one surgeon, that's me. Uh, the other surgeon is going to be Amjad Pave because we cover the whole of the period from the 80s to, he was one of my uh, trainees long ago. And uh, he and I, he now using robots and uh, minimally invasive surgery particularly, had the same objectives, which was to get perfect TMEs. We didn't get them always perfect, of course, but it was the training going back to me and my uh, lifetime of uh, trying to teach 
uh, the Dutch TME workshops did more good than anything that we'd ever seen. Warren Anker was saying I was wrong because we were, he argued eventually he was wrong because what really mattered, the dramatic improvements, the fall in local recurrence rates from 40% to 5%, that they were really coming from what you see in the printed uh, sharp dissection under direct vision with skilled traction and counter traction with the objective of TME. Uh, we wanted to randomize TME in the Dutch TME trial, but that is impossible. We can't stop and say why, but essentially what we learned from randomizing the adding of short course radiotherapy that you could have the local recurrence rate having trained people to try to do TMEs. Uh, just a little postscript to that study, missed from it all from that lady's uh, uh, thesis was that actually it, I got most of the credit for the fall in local recurrence. And I believe that was, I, well, anyway, shall we say TME got the credit, um, but actually the addition of crude old fashioned two and then three field radiotherapy did reduce by 70% the deaths that took several years, which used to be the curse of uh, rectal cancer surgery in the 20th century. It's worth remembering that, those slow deaths. And it was the workshops that did the Dutch the most good. Are lat lateral pelvic nodes clinically important? That's really what I'm trying to ask you all to consider. Uh, there's no question that Geosug, my dear friend, is the most wonderful surgeon. Um, but my argument is simply that, of course, lateral lymph nodes involved are, are a prognostic indicator. The question is, does his brilliant surgery actually make much difference to the outcome? I have to confess I've been teaching TME all my life. I only finished when the pandemic came. Uh, my last uh, teaching case was just before COVID. Uh, and uh, I have to say that when MRI came along, suspicious pelvic sidewall nodes were not an independent prognostic indicator according to our Mercury study. And there had been no lateral node dissections at all done. MRI, Gina Brown, Mercury, suspicious nodes, no lateral node surgery, not an independent risk factor for cancer control, survival, and so on. And then Leonard Blumquist from the Karolinska analyzed in some detail the fact that it was mesorectal residues because we surgeons were not doing the operation well enough across Sweden that were the source of at least uh, more than half of the local recurrences. The, if he looked at 880 patients, 33 local recurrences, 27 low down, and only two were interpreted by him as coming from lateral lymph nodes. Now look at Amjad Pave. He's the modern TME only man, if you like, and he has excellent figures. I haven't time to stop with them. But uh, essentially, uh, his local recurrence rate in the potentially curable cases is below 2%. And he's done no lateral prophylactic lymph node dissections. So this is uh, another person who has learned with more modern things like robots. Uh, he has six MR detected lateral nodes. We could talk about them but they didn't really add up to very much. And I haven't time to talk about the detail. Will uh, Gina Brown even wonders whether we have uh, taken much too much notice of lymph nodes themselves and using them as the staging marker uh, is probably wrong because it's extramural vascular invasion and tumor deposits that matter. Look, for instance, at the work published by Amy Lord, 615 patients. Uh, what you see is a huge difference.
from EMVI, a huge difference from nodal deposits within the mesorectum, um, no lateral lymph node deposits, and, uh, sorry, no lateral lymph node, uh, of course there'll be some deposits, but no lateral lymph node operations, and yet the presence of uh, all lymph nodes see, does not seem to predict. Look at that compared with the big differences. If you go back there for this big series, huge difference from vascular invasion, huge difference from tumor deposits, and virtually no difference from, um, okay. So maybe we will relearn about the importance that it's these other ways that the tumor uh, spreads that really matter. If you apply the principles of ontogenetic anatomy, you think entirely of embryological, uh, fascial covered uh, envelopes. And uh, we have this, I think this is the paper that I've got involved with, with uh, Calvin Coffey, that has something like 20 times as many uh, reads. Um, it's not a, it's a strange paper, but what it's saying is the organ is the mesentery and the gut develops within it. Uh, the anatomists, of course, will not take that. They don't like that at all. TME is exception of the proper rectum with its blood supply. So where are we going to? Better radiotherapy is coming. TME surgery endures. And now we have the watch and wait awareness problem. A science of lateral nodes persists and develops in the West, but all of the science is over there. But when we have uh, stereotactic uh, radiotherapy, um, of a high quality with the modern machines and uh, intensity modulation. What are we doing at Champalamo? Better radiotherapy when the margin is positive, of course we give it. Uh, maybe we should be giving it for everyone, but why would that be? It's because it's becoming aware, we're becoming aware that with the best radiotherapy, the best focused radiation, and having people who are thinking about the chances of having no operation at all, a very lovely idea for the patient, not such an enjoyable idea for us surgeons, but it's maybe the biggest step forward for the next decade. We will offer something that we call workup week. That means you come, and you are fully assessed with the best possible imaging and by gastroenterologists and beautiful endoscopy. And uh, I think in the end, it'll be short course radiotherapy for many more people than uh, I have previously recommended it for. So I think Did we miss uh, Professor Hill, the connection? Yes, yes it looks like that. Anyhow, uh, we came to the time limit and I think we came to the end uh, of his uh, speech. I'm sure he's gonna reconnect. Uh, Rita Nariaki, do we have a question first of all from our colleagues? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your present, great presentation, the, uh, Professor Choi. Uh, we have a question from the audience. First, uh, uh, what's the uh, acceptable cut of lymph node diameter to perform lateral uh, lymph node uh, pelvic dissection? Second, uh, please, uh, could you give me, give, could you give us the, your opinion about the selective lateral lymph node dissection for low and middle rectal cancer uh, based on the intraoperative sensitive node evaluation by ICG uh, or the number of the CK99 and the intraoperative one-step nucleotide uh, acid amplification? Uh, thank you. Very good question. 
And during my presentation, I already uh, mentioned about it is very hard to say that, that this is a really uh, valuable cutoff value. But most of uh, surgeons believe that the five millimeter up to seven millimeter is their uh, clinically valuable cutoff value. But the most important thing is if you are really expert, you have to understand that the whole picture, whole picture of the tumor. When the tumor is very aggressive, even if it's less than five millimeter, if you see the, the suspicious lateral pelvic nodes uh, on the uh, pelvic MRI, you may do lateral pelvic node dissection. Sometimes, you know, there are some inflammation can affect the enlargement of the lateral pelvic node. So you have to think about the whole picture, not only for those just uh, five millimeter, seven millimeter of the rotor pelvic node. And second question uh, is, you know, ICG and the, uh, the lymph node mapping, it is okay, but it is not accurate because, you know, rotor pelvic uh, spread is coming from the rectum into the mid hemorrhoidal uh, lymphatic channel. So it is quite difficult to choose a sentinel lymph node. This is the deepest part of the pelvic wall. So if you pick up that sentinel lymph node, you have to remove all of these things. So I don't recommend any sentinel node uh, for rectal cancer, I, I'm not saying the uh, OBGYN or some, some other urologic one, but rectal cancer is certainly from, from the mesorectum to the rectal pelvic nodes through the mid hemorrhoidal channel. So it is the deepest as the most difficult part. So that is quite difficult to do sentinel lymph nodes, the uh, uh, mapping. Thank you very much. Rita, do you have any other questions? Yes, one additional question for Professor Choi. What are the lymph nodes most commonly involved with metastasis that need a dissection, resection when we yeah. do lateral lymph node? Yeah, that is also a great question. As, as I mentioned uh, already, you know, there, we have to remember that the uh, lymphatic flow, which is uh, uh, the mid hemorrhoidal uh, lymphatic channel, so internal iliac is the most common and the most important and most difficult part to remove it. And next is the obturate group. Obturate is quite a spacious area. It is quite easier to remove the lymph node, but that is the second most important. First, internal iliac. You do obturate dissection only, you may miss some uh, more important lymph node. Some part, you know, even you do rotor pelvic node dissection, maybe you have great chance of recurrences on the pelvic side wall. So if you uh, decided to do rotor pelvic node dissection, you have to clear all internal iliac group completely. Thank you very much. Uh, before moving uh, to the next uh, topic, I would like to ask a question, a personal question to Professor Choi. Um, how far do you think we are from a real uh, biochemical uh, fingerprinting of the tumor? Because you mentioned a very nice uh, metaphor, I think. Look at the old picture of the tumor instead of uh, just looking at uh, little details like uh, nodes diameter, we know by itself it's uh, just uh, a sign but it's not really predictive especially if the nodes are mm -hmm. little we should have a more specific agent in order to identify the positive nodes but we all know i mean cancer is a, a biochemical disease is a disease of the dna and we know that uh, biotechnology is going into that direction and allow us today to really find the finger uh, fingerprint of the tumor so uh, in your experience or which is your uh, forecast about uh, when we would uh, finally move uh, from uh, a classification of the tumor based on anatomical finding and radiological finding that uh, looks to me like uh, something of the past 
to a more modern uh, biological assessment? Sir, I have to say, is, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry not to uh, answer that question because I have uh, uh, no experience of uh, that area to expect to predict rather pelvic nose metastasis. But the conversely, may I ask you, you know, without any those molecular workup, uh, if you have chance of a 20% or 10% uh, lymph node metastasis, which is uh, uh, commonly recommended for early cancer, the lymph node metastasis is only five to 20% SM tumor, so mucosal tumor. But we recommend those patients to have a standard surgery. So rotor pelvic nose, if you say five millimeter in initial MRI, that lymph, uh, lymph node metastasis rate without radiation, if you do radiation, it goes down, but without radiation, it's just 21%. So it's uh, higher than the SM tumor uh, lymph node metastasis. So if you say that the five mm to one centimeters, even more than, uh, bigger than one centimeters, the probability, even after chemo radiation, positive rate is more than one third, 30%. So it is, you know, fact. I'm not, I'm not sure that this Western, uh, you know, uh, patients are different from the Eastern patient, but if those patients are quite similar, you may have one third of chance of rotor terminal metastasis, even after chemo radiation. So one third is a great number, is a reason to do rotor pregnation. Thank you Thank very you. much, Professor Choi. Again, uh, this is a hot topic. I don't think we are going to uh, produce any final uh, statement today. Uh, what we want to stimulate is uh, the discussion within the experts and uh, stimulate also more colleagues around the world to run uh, extensive uh, research in order to improve the daily practice. On my side, I can only say that along the years, I've seen uh, so many uh, confounding factors entering into the uh, scenario that nowadays when we talk about uh, rectal cancer treatment, we have uh, first uh, to assess uh, the type of tumor in a more defined way. Then we should uh, specify exactly which type of uh, chemotherapy patients has received or not. Uh, which type of radiotherapy with which machine according to which protocol is the quality of the radiotherapy done perfectly so when we discuss about uh, we do this uh, we really don't know exactly what we are doing I mean it is very difficult to compare exactly a TME done by Ar uh, Armad Parve, uh, Parve or Professor Hilt with a TME that can be done by any other of us uh, because when you see also the results of Professor Hilda, I'm very sorry that he's not connecting back, 1.5% um, local recurrence, and you think that these are very serious uh, experts, uh, very well known. I mean, uh, I have to trust absolutely the results. Uh, you have to question why we have then a higher a percentage of local recurrence and we focus the attention on the lateral nodes. So... It's a hot topic. We don't look for the definitive answer. We thank you very much for being with us always. It's really a, a pleasure to have you uh, at the IRCAD colorectal courses. And now uh, we move on with the next session. Uh, and it's a pleasure. I would ask, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Rita to present first the results of the international survey. And then we uh, invite Professor Fukunaga and uh, our friend, a very good friend, uh, Sarah Rasil, again from Spain. 
Yes, thank you, Antonella. For our survey, we, we ask at your institution what treatment options are available for elderly colon tumors. And as you can see here in Europe, we have 31% that we do ESD. And in Western Pacific countries, we have 35%. It was not surprising that the cells was more common in European countries, and contrarily, the LEX procedure is more common in the Western Pacific. And when we evaluate how many uh, cases of uh, ESD your institution performs annually, we can see that in Europe still we are not uh, very efficient because although we have 41% of uh, institutions that they do perform ESD, um, they didn't have uh, more than 100 cases compared to uh, Western Pacific countries that have 30% of the cases. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, despite we know the effectiveness of ESD, we have to acknowledge that uh, in Europe and Western countries, uh, we still have a lot uh, to, to run on the way. Uh, so, Professor Fukunaga, please can you uh, present your uh, point? And then we have Hi. Professor Serra Rasil. Thank you very much. Please start the slides. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to have an opportunity of talking about local resection of colorectal tumor in our institution. This is a therapeutic strategy for colorectal epithelium neoplasm by Japanese guideline, maybe the same as the global one. In a word, adenoma, TIS cancer, and submucosal salivary cancer should be rejected by endoscopic resection, including endoscopic mucosal resection and the submucosal dissection method. If it advances to over submucosal deep layer, it is routinely rejected by surgery, meaning segmental colectomy with lymph node dissection. There are some cases which should be rejected by endoscopic resection in the left side box, but it would be difficult in completely unblocked resection. For such case, surgeons commonly select segmental colectomy because of its developed safe technique. Otherwise, it could be rejected by alternative technique for full thickness local resection. If seeing such cases, the segmental colectomy could be over surgery because of the tumor should be limited to mucosal layer. Given a question of this, I would answer to perform lab colectomy in the past, but in new concept to use an endoscopic full thickness device or make collaboration of the endoscopists and the surgeons. When you read this randomized control trial paper of colorectal disease in 2016, the local resection for the large polyp were confirmed less invasive than conventional segmental colectomy based on the results of the estimated blood loss or post-operative cause. This is a paper from our institution being compared between the LEX group and the conventional colectomy group. The hospital stay is shorter and the inflammation data are less. The post-operative complications happens even rare in the conventional group. We expect less invasive in local resection than segmental colectomy. In terms of endoscopic full thickness resection, some unique devices have been developed. However, the results of this usage is not satisfied. Considerable complications come out, not satisfied ratio of R0 rejection. In terms of collaboration of endoscopists and surgeons, there have been several reports so far. However, it may be difficult to keep the satisfied margin from the tumor in all reports. Procedure of the legs was originally developed for submucosal tumor of the stomach by Professor Hiki in Japan. 
we adopted this technique to the colorectal tumors. Firstly, circumferential mucosal incision is made with appropriate rejection margin. Second, intentionally perforation is made at one point. The laparoscopic rejection also helps the endoscopic procedure. Important point is keeping an appropriate margin, complete unblocked rejection. When closing the defect of the column, stapling in a short axis direction is the most important to avoid stenosis. And you can confirm the postoperative bleeding and sealing of the stapling by endoscopy and prevention of stenosis. This is indications for LexCR. Common cases are those involving appendix orifice. Next, those with submucosal fibrosis and with diverticulum. Submucosal tumor is not so common in the colon, but indicated. This case is lateral spreading tumor on the diverticulum. I show you a short video. Firstly, the tumor location is confirmed. The markings are put around the tumor and the submucosal incision is made by endoscopy. The intentional perforation is put on a point. The laparoscopic and endoscopic rejection is performed. The specimen is retrieved through inside. The defect is closed by staplers. Even for such a localized adenoma on the orifice of the appendix, the distance between the tumor to the Bowen's valve appears to be so near from outside. I show you another short video of the lateral spreading tumor on the appendix orifice. Meso appendix is dissected. The tumor is LSD on the appendix orifice. The irrigation is performed. The submucosal incision is made, intentional perforation, and endoscopic dissection, and the laparoscopic resection. This is a collaboration between them. The specimen is retrieved inside. But the effect is closed by staplers. This is a summary of our experience of LexGL. The most common reason for selecting LexGL is relating to the appendix orifice. Next, submucosal fibrosis. No complications after the LexGL happened so far. Complete unbroke resection was carried out to all cases. Summary. There are limitations for trying ER even for an adenoma or TIS cancer. For such cases, the local resection may be less invasive than conventional segmental colectomy. Technique of LEX makes a role for keeping an appropriate rejection margin by unbroke rejection. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fukunaga. We listen first to uh, Professor Sarah Rasil and then uh, we open the discussion. Xavier, good morning. Hello, good morning. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, fine. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Yes, very nice to see you, to see all of you. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation for this very, very interesting uh, webinar that you have organized. And uh, this point of view, uh, I think is really, really very, very interesting. So um, uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Um, and it's going to be a little bit uh, different from the point of view that I, I'm going to focus 
about uh, can you see it yes yeah, okay absolutely yeah okay because i'm going to focus about the uh, the rectal tumors but uh, the concept of uh, of local excision is one of the things that i'm going um, to uh, to let you know how we do it in in order to to do the the lo local resections so uh, from this point of view and no conflict of interest um, so how to manage large adenomas uh, we do it by local excision doing transanal endoscopic surgery and uh, we think that total wall excision is necessary and uh, I'm going to try to show you why we recommend these things. And uh, it's based uh, in, in several um, studies that we have carried out. So in this, in this study, as you, uh, you can see from uh, 277 uh, adenomas, uh, we've, we found that in nearly 19% of, of those adenomas, there were uh, adeno infiltrative adenocarcinoma from those um, half of those were PG1. PG1 that if you do, if you do a, a curative uh, treatment, surgical treatment in block, uh, you know that it is curative and uh, because otherwise uh, you will have to do a total mesorectal excision. Um, in, this, in this situation, in other study, in a more recent study, uh, you, can, you can see that in, uh, in uh, 481 adenomas that we treat by, by, by TM, TO, local excisions. We do a local wall excision and uh, we found that uh, more or less the same, the same numbers, 20%, uh, we found um, infiltrative adenocarcinoma and in 62% there were uh, PT1. We have to know that if we do a real uh, free, uh, free margins, there are just uh, two eight percent of recurrence, but if they are involved, uh, it 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 could be up uh, twelve percent. So uh, that is why we think that total wall excision is one of of the main of the main uh, part of the treatment. And um, and even if we have a recurrence, we can do it by uh, transanal endoscopic surgery. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, we all want to have the minimum invasive surgery for all uh, for any kind of, of tumor. We have to know that the morbidity and uh, and uh, quality of life for uh, minimal invasive surgery uh, is really low. Uh, for endoscopic polypectomy (ESD), we know that really um, the morbidity is very low. I think. It, is, 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 is lower than for local excision. Those are our number from a quite a large um, uh, study. And, uh, but if we um, uh, fail, if we, if we, if we don't, well, you don't do the right uh, surgery, we then we have to do a total mesorectal excision. And the problem that we have are that, uh, that the morbidity and morbidity and, uh, and, and sexual and, and uh, genital urinary uh, dysfunction are really high. But the thing uh, with the local excision that, that we don't control the, uh, the, the adenopathies, the, uh, the nodes, and uh, this is uh, when we have uh, the uh, early or in the submucosa uh, infiltrative adenocarcinoma. In those cases, that means uh, in PT1, if we don't have high risk features, uh, that means that local excision with uh, uh, more than one millimeter for margin, it's enough. But if we have high risk features, that means that a transanal, uh, a total mesorectal excision, it is necessary. But the things is which are the um, high risk features. So uh, the high risk features, as we all know, are those that are, that comes from a bad surgery or that comes from a bad and a, and a pathological features. Because if we do a local excision above the muscularis mucosa, we know that there is no risk of nodes. But 
if we uh, each each an invasive in sub mucosa, the problems are the risk of lymph nodes that it, they could be until uh, 20%. So what are the high risk feature? Uh, positive margins, lymphovascular invasion, poor differentiated tumors, and the invasion to SM3. Um, the thing is that when you analyze the pathological findings for uh, uh, very lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasions, those are really, really very low, as I will, we will show you in a study that we, 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 we have done. So is the invasion, the submucosa, the more important thing? So uh, there are several, uh, there are several uh, factors that give us the possible recurrence as we said before. That means that if you have those pathologic bad factors and the main is the death submucosa, uh, you can uh, reach until 39% of local recurrence. But if you have uh, good pathologic factors, but if you do a good surgery, uh, the recurrence is less than 5%. So uh, the problem is to accuracy the measuring of the submucosal invasion. The current classification depends on the morphology and the presence of the muscularis mucosa, because it's the way how to uh, measure the invasion of the muscularis mucosa. So in that way, we know, or most of us, we, we know the Kikuchi classification that is very important to know if you have a SM1, SM2, SM3. And that is because if you have SM1, uh, the risk of nodes are 1, 3%, and SM2, 8%, and SM3, 23%. But the definition of SM3 is just when there is invasion of 200, 300 micras. But what means that is very, very deep? Is, is low, is very uh, inside the, the submucosa because SM2 is, inter, is intermediate and SM3, the definition is near the muscularis propria. So really the definitions uh, of the Kikuchi classification give us uh, very few uh, information about what is SM1, SM2, SM3. When we go to Kudo's classification, and then we know that the invasion, it depends of the third is the, the first third, the second or the third. But the problem is that uh, we don't really know where the muscularis mucosa or from where we can measure. This is uh, another classification that means in Kitajima classification when he says that when it's more than 1000 meters of invasion, the risk of nodes, it's very high. The thing is also, also the same that where do you measure? Because uh, the muscularis mucosa not always is present. So depending on where you are measuring, the, uh, you can have a measure and different measure from one side on from another. So those are the problems of those classification and the same for the UNOS classification. So here you have a pathological view of the uh, one T1 and the invasion of the submucosa. In this, in, this, uh, in, in, in this example, there is no muscularis mucosa. So you don't know where exactly the way how to measure the invasion of the submucosa. But if you have a total wall excision, you know where the muscular is and you know exactly that the muscular propia is there. So uh, we uh, suggest the measure from uh, below, from above, in instead of what is measured normally, and uh, measuring the healthy residual submucosa. So in this study is where we recommend uh, this uh, kind of measure, because if you are total wall excision, you have always the muscular propria. So in that way, you know the minimum distance of healthy mucosa, and, this, and, and in those cases, when you have a total wall excision, you have always the muscular propia, and in that, in that sense, you have to, to, to know that when you are measuring the, the thickness of the submucosa is really but very variable, uh, and uh, it's not the same when it's near the tumor than it's, it's outside of the tumor. And the, pres the presence of the muscular mucosa is, very, is really low, is 
only 35%. But if you have a total wall extinction, in 96% of the cases, you have the uh, landmark to measure the invasion of the submucosa. When you are trying to know if the, um, the pathologic factors are, uh, are uh, very, very, very important, you have to know in, in those cases that are really low when you are uh, leading with a T1 uh, adenocarcinoma. So this is our recommendation or suggestion why we suggest a total wall excision because that not depends of the, uh, of the morphology of the lesion, but it's true that this concept, uh, very uh, large numbers of the study uh, must be carried on uh, in order to know uh, uh, exactly the healthy submucosa is the, the distance to have a safe, a safe uh, 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 resection. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fukunaga. And uh, do we have any question, uh, Nariaki? Oh, yes, uh, I have a question. Thank you very much for your uh, great presentation. Professor Fukunaga, excuse me, may I ask uh, one question? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, the, if uh, we want to uh, introduce the LIC CR procedure, uh, we need a very good uh, the endoscopics who have a good technique of the ESD. Sure, and, uh, sure. Yeah. But That's according right. to the uh, result of our survey, the colorectal ESD is not so common in Europe than in oh, Asian right. countries. So what do you think about it takes uh, time to introduce it uh, to Europe, uh, European institution? Yeah, but uh, uh, this Lex CL is not a uh, purely uh, submucosal dissection. Just make a rail of the submucosal incision around the tumor, uh, keeping the appropriate uh, surgical margin. And at that point, uh, the, I show you, uh, as I showed you before, um, intentionally perforation is made. So the so technically high high technically submucosal dissection is not need. So uh, just um, local injection in the submucosal layer and making the uh, submucosal incision around the tumor is just only a uh, technique for this uh, uh, tech, uh, procedure uh, by for endoscopists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are accumulating some little delay, so I won't push further the discussion on this topic, if not to mention that even for um, endoscopic treatment and for local treatment, I think it's the time to develop uh, new uh, markers and new predictive uh, factors. We can't rely anymore just on picture or imaging, even uh, if they can be more advanced. And then in terms of skills, uh, we all know that the technology is moving uh, very fast and in the proper direction. So in the next uh, coming years, we will see more advanced endoscopic platform. We will see more robotic endoscopic platform. So this lack of expertise would, uh, would be uh, solved in my opinion. So what will remain, it's just uh, really the idea of uh, creating a frame where we know exactly which treatment to propose to which patient. So this is another hot topic that will remain open uh, for further discussion during the IRCAD courses. And uh, we invite all of you to join uh, the, the Institute and also uh, knowing that uh, at IRCAD there is a strong, strong uh, endoscopic uh, operative program that is developed by Professor Silvana Perretta and uh, we strongly advise uh, all the young surgeons to join this type of programs because uh, flexible operative endoscopy will be the surgery of uh, today and tomorrow. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, two great friends that are gonna conclude uh, this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, my very dear friend Masaki Ito, an excellent uh, Japanese uh, samurai who is uh, doing a fantastic uh, operation. It's always impressive what he can do. And he's also on the edge of technological development. And uh, my very dear friend, uh, since a long time, Salvador Morales Conde, who is uh, our very greeted uh, president of the EIS, of which I'm very proud. 
uh, that he's there and he's doing a great job. So this is a very hot uh, topic. Uh, when would we imagine that one day we would question whether or not we have to give more chemo radiotherapy or we have to give only chemo radiotherapy. So we move from one side to the exact opposite. And so I would uh, invite Rita to present the results of our international survey first. Yes, so we ask our participants if they routinely use neoadjuvant the therapy for advanced rectal cancer. And as we can see in Europe, only 10% don't use uh, chemo radiotherapy compared to 24% in Western Pacific countries. And I think that this is very important uh, to stress, like Antonello said, because we have different treatment modalities that allow to different uh, different outcomes in the patients but it's really important the the neoadjuvant therapy in our opinion and i will only like to say that uh, this could lead from some patients to to have a clinical complete response and nowadays we are evaluating these patients with new advanced technology and in this course we are also promoting the cas that is an european consortium in which we evaluate target fluorescence agents to improve uh, such strategies so we can uh, move forward with the presentation of Professor Masaki Ito uh, that will uh, give our, his experience uh, from, the, from the Eastern side. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me this great opportunity. So thanks, Jack and uh, Nariuki and Rita. So today, so I'd like to uh, present uh, about uh, sorry, about the neoadjuvant CRT for advanced rectal cancer, and uh, I'd like to show the uh, our Japanese experience, and uh, we need to discuss the, uh, some difference between the eastern and the western. So uh, we should know the uh, great evidence of the neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy. Uh, th these reports clearly shows the preoperative chemo radiotherapy therapy is better than post-operative chemoradiotherapy. And also, uh, preoperative chemoradiotherapy is better than preoperative radiotherapy. So however, that this is, uh, we need to focus a very uh, true point. So CRT only reducing local recurrence rate, not uh, uh, overall survival rate. So in the current status of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so we showed the Japanese guideline in 2022. Uh, neoadjuvant CRT is not standard in Japan, and uh, we really recommend it for high-risk rectal cancer. And uh, uh, it is controversial whether uh, CRT can be alternative to lateral pelvic node dissection or not. The efficacy and the safety of watch and wait strategy have not been established yet in Japan. And also neoadjuvant chemo is not recommended because of lack of the evidence. So first of all, uh, this is a very great study conducted in Japanese group, uh, JIG0212. So this uh, study is only uh, people uh, uh, of the upfront surgery without chemo radiotherapy. So we focus on the uh, outcome uh, in terms of the local recurrence site. So uh, this uh, shows that uh, this is a randomized control trial. So the background is the same between the two groups. So uh, uh, lateral lymphoid group uh, showed 7.4% uh, of local recurrence and uh, uh, omitting the uh, lateral lymphoid dissection showed 12.6%. So the local recurrence is double in uh, uh, omitting the lateral lymph node dissection. And, uh, uh, um, and we need to focus the site of the local recurrence area. Uh, lateral pelvic uh, recurrence is uh, six times more uh, if the, uh, we omit the lateral lymph node dissection. So the, uh, we focusing to the uh, uh, omitting to the uh, lateral lymph node recurrence so focusing only in the central TME area. So uh, local recurrence is the same. And also the local recurrence rate is uh, uh, about 6%. Uh, 
So maybe uh, these result, uh, I, rec uh, I uh, think that uh, lateral lymph node dissection, uh, lateral lymph node area is uh, uh, one of the very important area uh, to, uh, uh, in terms of the local recurrence. And also maybe uh, if, uh, like Japanese society, if we omit uh, chemoradial therapy, maybe about that, uh, we uh, found the 6.0% of the lo uh, local recurrence rate in central area. So uh, it, this is a, a real world in Japan. That this is a question from the uh, Japanese many institute. So uh, this is a real world. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy was only performed in 9%. And upper surgery was performed in eight, 84%. This is a real world data in Japan. So uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we know the recent strategy for uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy in US and Europe. So in US, the chemoradiotherapy is a, a standard therapy for T3, middle or low electro cancer. And uh, ESMO guidelines a little bit changed uh, from 2017. Uh, mainly the T3 is a, a, a standard uh, is a, a candidate for the chemoradial therapy, but uh, less CRM and uh, less DME and uh, negative EMVI. So these uh, factors it included patient uh, could omit uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. However, chemoradiotherapy is a potentially have a very adverse event of the uh, boil function after chemoradiotherapy, uh, followed by the TME or ISR. And also uh, late adverse event, uh, such as a small boil obstruction, uh, second cancer, inner function and sexual function. Uh, these adverse event of uh, having the chemoradiotherapy is uh, one of the very important aspect of the uh, strat uh, treatment strategy. So that this is uh, uh, our data of the National Cancer Center Hospital East uh, 2010 to 2018, that these patients only are uh, upfront surgery. So a uh, long-term outcome is shown in this slide. So three years local recurrence is 8.7 and uh, five years local recurrence rate is 10.8%. Uh, uh, I think that this is not, not good. So uh, we analyzed a uh, risk factor for local recurrence in this cohort. So a uh, positive uh, EMVI, and also the positive uh, CRM is a, a very uh, statistically significant factors related to uh, the local recurrence. And uh, also uh, risk factor of the distal recurrence is uh, EMVI is uh, strongly co uh, associated with uh, uh, distant metastasis. So they, uh, we uh, currently the change it to this uh, strategy in our hospital if we found a CRM positive uh, initial MRI, uh, we do the uh, chemoradiotherapy. And also the uh, MRI shows uh, EMVI positive, uh, we performed uh, TNT because uh, uh, these have uh, some potential of the distal metastasis. And the clinical N2 and uh, lateral lymph node uh, positive group, we preoperative treatment is uh, determined individually. So uh, finally, that we uh, showed uh, some new uh, study conducted in our institute. Uh, this study is a voltage trial. So the uh, initially that we performed the uh, uh, neo uh, C uh, chemo radiotherapy and followed by uh, nivolumab, uh, totally the uh, five cycle, and followed by the radical surgery. So this is a patient is not only for the uh, MSS patient, but also the MS high, MSI high uh, patient. So uh, this uh, group is uh, 39 patient and five patient. So uh, this is very important uh, uh, future potential of this uh, trial, this treatment. So if the patient is uh, MSS, but uh, PCR, complete remission rate is 30%. Uh, it is very uh, higher than uh, usual CRT uh, outcome. And also, uh, MSI high patient, 
uh, it is only included five patients, but uh, CR, PCR rate is uh, uh, 60%. This is a very uh, good result. So uh, in conclusion of my talk is uh, in Japan, uh, traditionally the, our main strategy for rectal cancer is still a front surgery. Uh, however, our uh, institute is a little bit approaching to the Western strategy and change to the upper surgery to uh, chemo radiotherapy for T3 middle low rectal cancer. However, we are, our indication is uh, limited to the high risk factor a patient only, such as a P positive CRM or a positive EMBI. And the recent our study of the voltage trial showed that CRT followed by consolidation evolved could increase the CR rate in both MSS and MSI high patient. And this uh, future trial, uh, future treatment would be promising strategy with high PCR rate, which enabled uh, the watch and wait strategy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Nari uh, Masaki. And uh, again, we move to directly to Salva so that uh, we have his lecture and then we open the final discussion. Please, Salva. So thank you very much, Antonello. Thank you, Rita, Nayaki, and, and the IRCAT, of course, to, to Professor Pesco for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure. And, and also a pressure to, to, to have this face-to-face -face with Professor Ito. It's a real uh, pleasure and an honor to be, to be here. So let's talk about this uh, uh, topic of neoadjuvant therapy and chemotherapy and see what happened in our system, in, in our hospital in Europe, in most of our center in this advanced rectal cancer treatment. This is my disclosure. So the question is why we should have neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And, 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 and the reason basically is because we really decrease the number of, of local recurrence. And this is the most important factor related to the use of neoadjuvant uh, chemo therapy. But on the other hand, and this is true, uh, it has not been demonstrated that distant metastasis decrease with uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So this is the main problem that we find. Uh, we really decrease local recurrence, but distant uh, metastasis stay the same. So at the end, uh, what is the problem? The problem is that due to this distant metastasis, there are the reason of morbidity and mortality. With this picture, what we have at the end is that overall, even if you give uh, natural and chemo radiotherapy, we will have the same overall survival. And this is the, uh, the rationality of not using uh, a natural and radiochemotherapy. But there is so many but about this, even that we have in the literature and in the experience, we have the same overall survival. Uh, there are some factors that are very important to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The one, the first one is because we really achieve downsizing, down, downsizing the tumor. And this is important because you have higher rate of preservation of the sphincter. And in the other side, we have higher rate of free circumferential margin. And that's the reason why we like to use Najuan chemotherapy to achieve this goal, especially in the type of patient we have here in, in, in Europe. On the other hand, and another factor that has been shown and is more uh, becoming more, uh, more and more popular, we've seen that in the last conclusion of Professor Ito, is that with these therapies, we get complete pathological response in many in some patients, and this is very important. And at the end, also, what we have observed by using this neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that even though we have the same overall survival, do we have a higher disease-free survival? And this is also very important. So regarding this issue that is becoming very popular, that we ob obtain, we achieve with neoadjuvant chemotherapy as complete pathological response, we can observe that this, in a meta-analysis published this year, is can be achieved in between something like 15 to 27 patients. And the um, most important factor is also that we don't have, with this, uh, with this strategy, higher risk of complication, which is very, very, very important. 
So this complete pathological response, let's say that it become one of the goal that we have organ preserving, not operating the patient. But this today, if we move of this old neoadjuvant chemotherapy to this concept of total neoadjuvant therapy, we obtain even more. And we can see in comparing these two uh, strategies, we can observe in this meta-analysis recently published that there is more complete pathological response when we use this concept of total neoadjuvant therapy. But also with this, this total neoadjuvant therapy, one of the factors that we obtain even better than with chemo preoperative and adjuvant chemo therapy is that we have a um, higher rate of disease-free survival. So we used to obtain higher rate of disease-free survival with no adjuvant chemotherapy, well, but with total neoadjuvant therapy, we even obtain higher rate of, uh, so, uh, of disease-free survival. But one thing, you see that in the paper published, higher disease-free survival, but we open a window for the future. And this is very important because this trial doesn't have the proper, uh, 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 proper follow-up, but we hope that we have taken longer follow-up. This concept or overall survival that was the doubt of neoadjuvant chemotherapy will be achieved. And at the end of the day, we will have for sure, uh, if we see the results that, the, that we have now, that maybe overall survival will be increased with this uh, concept of ne total neoadjuvant therapy. On one hand, more cases of, of complete uh, pathological response and more uh, overall survival in those cases that we need to operate. So even though what we have today with this same overall survival, with these bats that we put, there is another one. And this is also very important because after rectal surgery, not every patient will be able to undergo postoperative uh, chemoradiotherapy, which is the critical for systemic tumor control. So these are the four main reasons why, even that we have the same overall survival in the literature, we should, uh, we should work on having this neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. Sorry. So uh, um, with this, analysis also comes to my mind what to do with the different pattern of lymphatic spread of tumor cell because this also influence on the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You see, and we know already the pattern of uh, lymphatic spread of tumor cells. Of course, we know how to proceed with upper rectal cancer and with mid and lower rectal cancer regarding the mesorectum. Also, we know from the literature and from many papers what is normal, the pattern or lymphatic spread in upper rectum to the inferior mesenteric artery and also in the medial lower rectum to the lymph node in the internal iliac artery to the lateral lymph node. So we have this mix, this important mix of pattern of spread uh, of tumor cells depending on the location. And we know, and we've seen this paper that was presented by Professor Ito, that is important to do this lateral lymph node dissection because of this different pattern of, of, of tumor cell spread. So these are the difference between East and Europe. We can observe that is different. Uh, there are difference, and we uh, we observe that we are not uh, mostly in Europe. Not many people and we observe it in a survey that goes for um, lateral lymph node dissection because. This is what we do in the East, total mesorectal incision, lymph uh, node dissection, Europe, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to avoid this lateral lymph node dissection and perform just the TME. But uh, we observe that also we have uh, pronostic factors like, and we have seen that, like the diameters of the lymph node. And this is an important factor to decide what to do. So with this strategy, of also applying uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to our patient to avoid this lateral dissection and do the total mesorectal excision now comes and uh, we come with innovation. And I comes here with ICG as, uh, and, you, and you know, Antonello, I'm a fan of that. And ICG is not just uh, um, analyzing vascular supply, it's also lymphatic mapping. And we inject the ICG preoperative either uh, through uh, the anal 
uh, through just directly a preoperative uh, with a rectoscope or just directly uh, using a rectoscope. And then uh, we, we observe that this ICG injected, we can identify lateral lymph node and we are able to see and do just a tailor lymph adenectomy in those cases in which the uh, lateral lymph node are identified. And you can see, I hope you can see in this video how they light up and they guide you where to perform the uh, lateral lymph node in case is totally necessary. Also, Today, we have the tool to see this lymph node in the mesorectum. We have the tool, important tool also, if you go down to the pelvis and we are doing uh, dissecting here and doing a, a, a total mesorectal incision, we can see some lymph node that normally we consider that that's the reason of having uh, a recurrence, but you can see that this lymph node is in the middle colic, uh, in the middle rectal artery, and it's going rather to the pelvis, and we can get that, and uh, maybe are the reason of having this local recurrence more, uh, more uh, this link no more than a real local recurrence. So you see that the technology will give us so many information about the future of this, uh, of this identify uh, this link no, and that's the reason why I think it's important by neoadjuvant chemotherapy with this technology. And we can observe also, even in, like in this case, a lateral lymph node in the lateral side of the aorta in a patient that we were operating of the upper rectum. And we are able to identify this uh, lymph node, lateral ultra lymph node. So I think this is also important. Even in the future, we will have molecular target fluorophore, which is very important and have been mentioned by Rita, you can see that there are the now today. And I think that as a conclusion, we can, I can say that the trend today could be total neoadjuvant therapy because it's important to have systemic agent uh, to uh, guarantee that we uh, cure the patient and we have a better overall, uh, higher overall survival. The trend is to increase uh, the number of patients of, uh, with this policy of watch and wait strategy, and I think total neoadjuvant therapy will support this achievement for sure in the future. The future is to identify the pattern of lymphatic spread of tumor cells together with ICG. I think this is very important. This is what we're doing today. Our dream will have to have tumor with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and a dream for sure will be this, will be to have tracing with tumor cell affinity and to identify this, uh, this uh, lymph node uh, with, um, that are affected by tumor. So together this total adjuvant therapy to, talk, to treat this systemic disease together with a more accuracy in the local uh, dissection of the lymph node and the tumor, well, for, for sure it will be our dream and the trend that we have for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salva. Uh, always very inspiring uh, as, uh, as you are used to do. Uh, first of all, let's ask if there is any question to the colleagues. Yes. Thank you very much for your great presentation. So I, uh, we have uh, one question from the audience. Uh, the, if the patient received the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the patient had complete uh, radiolog uh, radiological response, the, but uh, we have low rectal cancer uh, that was colonoscopy biopsy. We found the patient. What is the next step? The watch and wait to a surgery or a colonoscopy survey and the multiple bi biopsies. Who wants to you, reply? <laughs> Salva, do you want to so reply? You mentioned that we have a biopsy that is negative. No. Uh, yes, I, yes, I think the question goes to no. a patient that has a complete clinical response. And then uh, yeah. how do you really assess him? Because we, what, they also want to know the strategy. How often do you do the surveillance, either by colonoscopy or you have to take biopsies, but how they, they accurate or you follow them by MRI? Uh, or you will decide that even if they have a clinical response, you, it, the patient will go to surgery. 
Uh, what I consider is first you have to have a nice protocol in your hospital. It's not a question of having one patient. It's a question of having a protocol in the in your in a, approved by your your ethical committee in your hospital to go, to do this policy. This is the first thing. The second thing is to talk to the patient and the family. I think this is very important to involve in the decision uh, the, the the family and, and to to analyze with them the literature and space and, and specify the risk that they are taking. This is the second thing that is very important. And the third thing is to have a very strict control of the, of, the, of the patient. What I mean with that is, for example, in some system, you have difficulty to say, I'm going to do an MRI during the first year every three months because the system cannot follow you in that policy. If you cannot do that, don't do it. So it's important to involve radiologists and everyone to do the things and the follow-up in the proper time. In the proper time, the rectoscopy, the MRI, and that's it. I, I think those are the most important thing that you have to consider. Thank you so, very much. Thank you very much. Masaki, do you want to add uh, any more comments, please? Masaki. Uh, I, actually, uh, we have a really experience of the watch and policy. So uh, if we judge the complete uh, C C C C R, however, uh, routinely we reset now. But uh, in the future, uh, we need to uh, collect uh, more watch and the patient. If the patient did uh, shown the uh, complete response uh, after chemoradiotherapy or the uh, other uh, very innovative uh, treatment. Okay, so I think uh, that as usual, we can continue for a couple of days more to discuss, uh, but we had uh, two hours. Uh, we are passing just the 10 minutes. That is not bad uh, for such a huge panel of experts from uh, all around the world. Uh, it has been really a pleasure for me. Uh, I really thank uh, each one of uh, you. Uh, it's really a privilege uh, to have this opportunity to, to share uh, all this competence, uh, all this experience, uh, uh, years and years of practice from Professor Hild, Professor Targarona, Professor Masaki, Professor Fukunaga, Professor Chen, Professor Choi, Professor Serarasil, uh, Professor Boyo, that is a new entry for IRCAD, so welcome in the family, you are very much welcome. And uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Armando, my very dear friend uh, from Brazil, for being a valuable director of the colorectal program uh, together with us. And uh, I think it's uh, appropriate that we leave uh, the end of the story uh, to Rita and Nariaki because this is their job and we have to value the young surgeons who invest so much into scientific research as they are doing. So please Rita and then Nariaki. Nothing, I just would like to thank you very much. We are honored to be in this uh, in this panel with such an expert. This is a very interesting topic and I would like to congratulate Nariaki because mm -hmm. the, the idea was uh, was from him and I just helped him to put uh, things together. But it was really, really interesting to really go into the de mm. details why there is so much difference between the countries. So I think there is still a lot to mm. to discuss, like Antonella say, thank you. Thank you for being here because he has to travel to My be pleasure. present today. <laughs> and to Professor Targarona and Professor Salvador Morales Conde that are our chairman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, the great presentation that every chair, uh, faculties and every chair. Uh, I really appreciate you. And then the, I went, since I came here, I had a similar, uh, mm, when we uh, have some discussion, the, some difference between Asian countries and East, uh, Western countries. Uh, I really want to say uh something but uh, uh due to the influence uh, very few participate from the asian country so uh i'm uh, really uh, uh i have a complaint about that uh we don't have enough discussion for the surgical uh collector surgical strategy uh treatment strategies but uh, i'm really happy uh i can uh make i can have a uh, very great uh, opportunity and a great placement to have a very sufficient discussion. I'm really honored. <laughs> I'm so happy. Thank you so much for everyone.
Thank you very much, uh, Ida Dagmas. And uh, <laughs> I, I invite uh, all of you to follow uh, the IRCAD activities and uh, we are always happy to welcome you here and uh, all around the world, IRCAD is expanding. We are gonna be in China, we are gonna be in the uh, United States uh, very soon. And so the opportunity to learn more every day will uh, enlarge in the next years to come. So once again, many thanks and uh, see you soon again on this channel. Bye. Hey. Bye bye. Thank you.